of PHP components. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff beyond PHP. So a lot of... Sorry. <laughs> so a lot of stuff outside the code as well. Let me quickly introduce myself uh, so that you know who I am. My name is Wim Gong. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle. Um, I'm the founder of a small Belgian-based uh, SLC company called Cube Solutions. Uh, I've been doing open source, most of these people, but also a lot of other stuff since around 1997. Um, I've developed stuff like OpenX, uh, PHP compatibility, uh, and a lot of other things. Oh, like, must have been working on a few of those certifications. And I've been doing these kinds of talks for the last three years or so, which is great fun, by the way. Very quickly about my company. Um, I know we don't do this, but I want to tell you a little bit about it because it's important for the rest of the uh, so, as I said, we do open source consultants, most of these people. But we also do a lot of other stuff, like we have our own high speed redundant network infrastructure with AGP and all sorts of uh, complex protocols running on it. That's pretty important uh, for the rest of the talk. So, we, we do a lot of high speed mobility stuff, uh, very big sites. Uh, mostly uh, IT companies and telecom companies are our, company, are our customers, but we also work for the Belgian Railways and stuff like that. We have a lot of big websites that we maintain and then develop. Okay, enough about me. Let's see who you are. Who here is a developer? Okay, most of you have thought of it. Who here has ever set up a MySQL master slave setup? Not so many. Okay. Has anyone here ever set up a site or an application that has that has a separate web server and a separate database server? Good, now keep your hands up for those of you who know how much traffic is going between the web and the database server. That's not so many anymore. So you can see we're up going. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Okay. So we're going to talk about things that we take for granted or Famous last words, it should work just fine, also known as, it works on my laptop. <laughs> so, yeah, everything that, you know, works fine on your laptop today and tomorrow doesn't work in production for some reason. I'm not going to be talking about the most common mistakes. I'm sure we all made those, we all know those, so I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about PHP code and the influence of your code on the rest of what we call the PHP ecosystem. Everything that revolves around each a lot of our modules involved. So, it all starts with our code. There are code links and stuff. So, first up, the database. Who has ever seen something like this? <laughs> Can anyone tell me what program generated this code? <laughs> Drupal, <laughs> yes, it's Drupal. <laughs> of course it's Drupal. I mean, if you analyze this query, it's insane. It's, it's, it, it, it simply copies things five times over. Like the date between is in there five times, identically. So it's, it's weird. So we don't want stuff like this, but I'm not going to talk an hour about you should not create queries like this. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about database index because a lot of people still don't do it, or a lot of you do it, but don't do it right. So, if we have, for example, a query that looks like this, so we get the ID from a table called stock, where the state is equals to, and we order by quantity. Where would you put indexes on this table? Where's the ID? <laughs> That's important, yeah. So you create an aggregate index, one index that joins the two, uh, those two fields. I changed something. Is it still the same? Yes or no? So do we still have stats and formula? Yes? No? Who says yes? No, it's one person says yes. The rest of it is yeah. Okay. Well, actually, this changes everything. That what one little difference, the, the equal sign to greater than. Um, and the reason is, as soon as you reach greater than, it sees it as a range sign. 
And so it stops processing the index. So what you need now is a separate index file for the status in the corner. So it's those little things that make, sometimes make a huge difference. Um, now a lot of people say, okay, you know what? Indexes make databases faster. We know that. So let's just index it. Let's put an index on every single column, and maybe on every combination of every single column. So of course you shouldn't do that. Uh, there's two reasons for that. Uh, first of all, every time you insert or update or delete a record, the index has to be updated. So if you have 50 indexes on the table, that means you have to update 50 indexes. Also, whenever you run a select query on it, it needs to evaluate whether it's going to use that index or not. So it's going to have to do that for every single index. So that's a bad idea. Now there's this guy called Bill Coward who works for Bracona, which is uh, a fork of MySQL. And he says, it's a very nice quote, he says, relational schema design is based on data, but index design is based on queries. So what that means is, whenever you build an application, the first thing you're probably going to do is, at some point you're going to build your data diagram. You're going to say, okay, I have this table and that table, and I have these fields in there. That's the moment where you put your primary keys in there, your foreign keys, but no, no other indexes. Only when you write your actual application code, you write your queries, that's when you know I'm going to need these exact indexes. And that's when you create. Otherwise, you have too many or not enough queries, uh, indexes. So only write your indexes, add your indexes when you're actually writing your queries on your code. Okay. So, how do you detect which queries cause problems? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, if you're using MySQL, but this works for other databases in a similar way, you can turn on what call the slow query log. Uh, the slow query log will list all the queries that are slower than a certain set of time. By default, I believe it's half a second. Um, and then it will show up in a log. Usually those queries need some kind of attention, maybe proper indexing and so on. There's also a flag in MySQL, and this is not valid for PostgreSQL or Oracle. Um, you can turn on a thing called log queries not using indexes. I think it's obvious what it will do. It will show you which queries are not using indexes. And then you can add those indexes. You can also turn on the general query log. Now be careful with this one. Um, if you turn this on, it will dump every single query that's being run on your system. Now if you're doing this on a production machine, you will get thousands and thousands. This has been running. I mean, if I go back to the graph, we got the back graph. It had been running for a while. That, that was our installation. And then suddenly this happened. So, what's causing those things? Uh, naturally, our first guess was code change. We went to the developers and they said, no, oh, we did not change a single thing. <clears throat> so, what did we do? Well, we turned on that general query log from MySQL and ran a query digest across it. It turned out that there were certain queries, three update queries, and one insert query that were about 50 times being run, this is much now. So, we went back to the developers and they said, we a small change, we put a for each somewhere. So, the biggest problem was, after three days, we had a bit of lag, and every hour we were adding lag, and one of the managers, a very clever guy, said, yeah, it's no problem, you know, during the night you'll catch up. No, it won't. It's not going to catch up, ever. So we were now running like six days behind or something, and they said, yeah, but it's fine, you know, we'll, we'll install a more powerful server, and it'll, it'll catch up. And we said, you know, even if, it, even if it's only running behind by three hours during the day, why do you have a MySQL master slave? It's for replication. Its purpose is that if your master crashes, you can switch to the slave server and make that your master. That's not going to work if it's running three hours behind. The big question was, why was that slave running behind? <clears throat> so, MySQL master slave, master server, slave server. The master is processing queries using 16 CPU cores. No problem at all. And it's using one CPU core actually to write those queries to a file. It's called a bin log file. And then that slave is going to copy that file 
using one CPU core again. To install the file system. Then it's going to execute all of that using one CPU thread. Because whatever the master wrote in that file has to be executed one after the other statement. Otherwise, it might get out of sync. If the, if the slave executes a query that's not to be executed yet, um, before the master does, in the wrong order, it will have different, possibly different uh, data on, on the disk. So the problem is, the master could spend 16 CPU cores to process all that data, the slave has to do it wrong. That just doesn't work. Not if you have that many queries. So what happened on the slave? <laughs> You can see that the, the top part of it she didn't really increase because it was already almost maxed out. And so it is just maxing out completely. It cannot handle more queries. So how do you fix this? Any suggestions? Have you used different setup for this? Sorry? Have you used a totally different setup? A totally different setup. Yeah. yeah, I think budget-wise, that wasn't possible. <laughs> just roll that into four queries. Basically, it's very simple. Sorry? Just roll all this stuff into four queries. Into a single insert and three others. Yeah, <coughs> that's one way of doing it. So what you can, can do is write a bit of code. <clears throat> I'm not going to detail you with the boring stuff, but basically what it will produce is something like this. Insert into show today, values, and then all the values. That's 50. Now you have a query for show today, one for show week, one for show month, and one for the show user. So you have only four queries instead of 50. So that's definitely a good solution. We went, eventually, we went for a different one, which was, yeah, okay. One remark, be careful. This works fine, 50. If you have like a million uh, things to insert, and you use this kind of statement, there's a, in my school, there's a max allowed package, which is the maximum size of one statement that you can send. And by default, depending on your configuration, it's either one megabyte or two, and sometimes eight. Um, so be careful there, you might go fast. But we ended up going for a very simple solution here. We added one line of code at the bottom, one line of code at the bottom, which is just, we said, do not auto commit, which basically means after each query, do not write to this immediately. But just wait, we're going to do more stuff. And so we spend, we execute all of those queries, and then at the end we say, commit, write this to this in one go, in one statement. And that's something that a slave can handle easily. You can execute all of those queries, and then just say, this once. It doesn't need all that CPU power. Because that's the biggest issue, biggest issue if you do not use this kind of system. But if you use all those, if you execute all those statements separately, it has to lock the table, it has to execute stuff, it has to unlock the table. In the meantime, it also has to update the index and so on. If you use, if you turn off auto commit, you execute everything at once, it has to update all those indexes only once, it has to write the disk only once. So that's something we did with this one. <coughs> So, for loops, bad, we do that. Um, but remember, if you add master slave and you're doing stuff like that, it gets a lot worse. Use transactions to group stuff together. It's common sense. Uh, in our case, the slave did catch up about five days later. <coughs> hasn't gone out of sync anymore since. It's just a good thing. Yeah, so we talk about databases a lot. Let's talk about some other stuff because we use PHP, we send stuff over the network. So logically, we need to make sure that everything's correct there. So we have another customer, customer Y. Uh, they have a pretty big site, one of the top 10, and they were growing very, very fast. And the funny thing was that in the busy hours of the day, they started getting weird errors. And they would actually try to fetch data from their database, and the connection would just drop. And we looked at the web server and it was actually hardly pulling any load and the database server was pulling no load, so there was no logical explanation. Uh, so we were called to go in there and check it out and fix it. How do you fix it? An issue like that, I mean, you lose database connections. Okay. So we went and had a look and we asked, you know, do you have any monitoring 
on your system here. You have a database server that's connected to a switch. You have a web server. That can we monitor, you know, do you use packets? Is there a network problem? Or, so we install the tool called IP traffic. You know what using that? IP traffic. Yeah. Okay. And what it showed us is very simple. They were sending 100 megabits per second from their database server to their web server. And their switch was only 100 megabits. <laughs> so it makes sense that they would lose connectivity because, I mean, they couldn't send any more data across it. So they were so happy and they said, yeah, it's fine now. Uh, we'll upgrade to a gigabit and everything's resolved. And they did. It was working. But we said, wait a second, why? Why the heck are you sending 100 megabits? Is not that big. So we went and checked, and turns out they were sending 700 gigabytes a day from their database server to their web server. They were sending 20, big, 16 gigabytes per day to the web. Doesn't really make sense, does it? Why do you request so much information from your database server and then send less than 10% of it to the web? So, what was causing this was, I'm sorry, any Drupal fans here? <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of Drupal hooks in there, and, and Drupal you know, uh, has a system where it, it attaches to a certain content block and stuff like that. And so, then it retrieves information, and then they decided, oh, but we don't need that information, so we just throw it away. Uh, that was causing major issues for them, so basically, the conclusion is, Load only the data that you really need, please. Uh, if you don't know what you're going to need from the start, do something called lazy loading. Most modern application frameworks allow you to do that. They only load on demand. And then, actually, it's even better because you're not only loading data on demand, you're also executing loading code only on demand. Uh, if you think, well, maybe you can just cache all of this, but it's actually the same story because you're still sending all of that data across the network. You want to avoid that. You don't want to send all that data across the network if you're not going to use it. And that's, there's more trouble on the network than just too much traffic. Um, another customer, customer Z. Pretty big site from Belgium. Uh, and they have a little news ticker. I think this is not very well visible. But it's like a typical news ticker, like the host, the latest news. Um, and actually, they would, the source of that data was another site that they also owned. Uh, what they would do is they would cache that information for 15 minutes so that they wouldn't have to hit their own web server, I mean, the other web server, every, uh, every second or every 10 times a second for every visit. So this was the code they were using. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with it? I mean, there's, there's plenty of stuff wrong with it. Sorry. Uh, it doesn't say the thumb process already. Uh, yeah, exactly. It doesn't actually look whether, whether, I mean, if there's five people executing this at the same time, you might run into a so, what they call a race condition. So, what are we doing here? We're checking the creation time of a certain cache file. We're checking if it's more than 15 minutes ago. And if it is, then we're going to delete that cache file. We're going to do a file get contents from the feed that we got. And we're going to provide it to that cache file. And then we're going to parse whatever is in the feed and do stuff with it. But let's just work with this code. Yeah? They are using files, not memory. Yeah, you're using a file system. You could put this in memory, which would be, would be a lot more efficient, like a memcache or Redis <coughs> memory caching system, which would also scale across more than one machine because you're storing files, which means you're storing it locally. I don't know. So, um, the problem they encountered was something that hasn't even been mentioned yet. So they had the source of that XML file, and then they had their actual web server. And that's what happened. <laughs> that data center went down and lost power. And so the other server was trying to catch that information. As soon as the 15 minutes, you know, the file expired, and it was trying to fetch it. And every single user that went to the website would see, oh, the cache file is more than 15 minutes old. I'm deleting it and I'm fetching that file, that XML feed. But it's not fetching it. 
How long did they have to wait? Any idea? So, yeah, more connections, more connections, more loads, more loads, more people waiting. And at some point, it wasn't just the page that contained the ticker. At some point, the fact sheet hits the maximum number of connections, and the entire site is down. Yeah, so how do we fix this? Well, the timeout fix is pretty easy. It's, it doesn't look good in the HTTP, honestly. But you need to create a stream context and set the HTTP timeout to maybe five seconds. It's better already than again if it's, if it's a local site or pretty close by. One second should do it. And then you just have to mention that context. Okay, so that fixes the timeout problem. There is the other problem, which is double delete. I mean, if you're doing file with contents, you're going to override it anyway. And I absolutely agree, do not store it on disk stored in memory using memcache or another memory caching system. Uh, also, another thing here, parse XML feed. We're doing that for every single user over and over again. You might want to do that right after you get the contents right before you put it in the cache. You put, put the parsed file there. Okay, so that works. Timeouts can be set on all of these and plenty more. Echo, Recurso, um, Socket Creates, uh, FSOC Open, and so on. Set a timeout. Default is 60 seconds, it's way too much for anything. So set it to maybe 5 seconds, maybe less than that. Uh, if, in this example, the XML source, for that feed, it was done by the same company. You might not want to do it this way. You might not want to pull that XML feed every 15 minutes. You might want to reverse it and say, you know, if the feed changes, tell us. Push the news to us. <coughs> That's only, of course, if you can trust that provider. Otherwise, they might push the news to you. <coughs> but you won't have a timeout issue anymore because you're not pulling every 15 minutes when the news maybe hasn't changed yet. And this is a critical one. Add logging to everything, especially stuff like this. If this is a job that runs every 15 minutes, every job you should log the result of it. And if there's a problem, you should be alerted of it immediately. And speaking about logging, logging is good. Logging in PHP using what? F open is a very bad idea. I see this a lot in, in production sites even. Um, they forget to disable that once they put it in production. So they do F open, right, and then they write a lot of stuff and F close. Problem is if you have 50 customers at the same time, that files are only locked. And you're not going to be, you're actually going to have your customers waiting until someone does the F close on, on that file. So, if you really have to do it, use file with contents with a file appendix to it, then it will just write whatever it is, whatever you want to write to the back of that file. Uh, we use Firefox. They use a tool called Fiber. Who uses Fiber? Good. Very good. Um, it's a very nice tool to debug your XHTML, your JavaScript, and your CSS, and so on. But there's also a tool called FirePHP, which is a plugin for it. Um, and it allows you to send debug information directly from PHP to Firebug without the user actually seeing it. Um, you can actually even turn this on in production if you really need it. Make sure that it is something you can turn on as a live. Finally, please, I said logging is good. You should have logs, but you should watch your logs. Um, if you have slow disks, and most system administrators, they think that databases, they should be on fast disks, and a lot of files, they should be on slow disks, because it's not so important. The thing is, you're writing to those log files. And when your disk is going to go with it, your system is going to slow down, and slow down, and slow down, just because you're trying to write a log file. So speaking about I.O., what calls is it? Well, anything that has excessive writing. Uh, Mostly swapping, if you have not built enough system memory, that's the biggest killer. But also, as I said, log files or database updates. Excessive reads can cause IO issues as well. Um, it's exactly the same thing. How do you detect it? Well, who here uses Linux? Okay. On production, who uses Windows?
ja sam
Ik hoop dat jullie op de game met al die niet uh, using de... Uh, using the simple file with comments. Sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just don't agree with, with this approach uh, with logging, using the micro comments because well, uh, you were mentioning the I/O problems, and this is very the exactly why we have I/O problems because every single log operations using such a such a technique will produce an I/O operation that has to be stored on the disk, and by that point it will be synchronized with the disk, and this is why we use system for instance to have a log first match to the memory and then sequentially we put it into the disk. Yeah. Uh, well, in the and, and the last part. Uh, well, <laughs> in your the approach, when you have a hit to the website, and the website that tries to log something, then basically using five contacts, every single piece of data will be directly written to the disk, right? Yeah. And basically, that, that will create an IO operation. Yeah. And this is, well, this is why I don't agree about the logs and the IO problems, because this is why you created the IO problems. I completely agree that using multiple contents with violent end is not a good idea. I, I absolutely agree that it's better than using that open, writing stuff, and then oh, of course it's the same. Yeah, except that you're, every time you're exactly locking the file, you might be doing stuff in between there, and the next user has to wait until all of that has been done and the file the F close is being called. Whereas if you do just file with contents with file event, it opens right and closes immediately. But are you sure that file open that uh, will, given the others on the will, uh, will write the data to the file uh, the proper I mean, if there is a many accurate users at the same time? Theoretically, it should. <laughs> but I'm saying it's a very bad idea. I absolutely agree. Yeah. If you uh, don't uh, say it explicitly, it gets written really to the disk the patterns at some time in the future. For example, for an EXT3 file system, that's up to five seconds in the future. Uh, so if you say, just write to the file, I don't care when it hits the disk, it doesn't really hit the disk at that very moment. So uh, you know, this approach with file put contents is actually uh, pretty okay regarding the I.O. patterns, because it simply appends uh, data to the file. Uh, in a well, at, uh, as uh, it's as easy on the I/O as possible because well, at some time, some point in time, the data has to hit the disk and you can't avoid that. Uh, but still, it does as little I/O, IO as possible. Another thing, yes, file put contents is guaranteed to be atomic in the append. Uh, well, POSIX standardizes it's about at least 512 bytes written to a file uh, in a single transaction will be atomic. Linux guarantees, I think, 4 kilobytes in a single write will be atomic, nothing will, uh, will, will hit in the meantime. So, if you limit your logs to half a kilobyte per line, you're safe. Yeah. Uh, that's very useful information. Okay, uh, but I have more, more of a comment about uh, your uh, database part. Uh, because much of this uh, part says that MySQL is atrocious. Uh, because much of these problems, basically all of these problems, except you know these uh, stupid queries, uh, were a result basically of MySQL being MySQL. And actually, no, no, you you get the same kind of stuff in every database. Uh, you know, not exactly, not exactly, because uh, for example, uh, you said you cannot, uh, well, queries on uh, well CRC32 over some column is slow, right? Uh, no, it isn't. You have to create a function index on that. Well, my SQL can't do that, sorry. Uh, another thing, you had uh, uh, turning off auto commit and uh, sped up your application, right? Okay, so this means that your, your transactions aren't safe. Because, uh, well, you're losing, losing data in case when something crashes. Yeah. Mm. Because these transactions don't hit the data. Well, I absolutely agree. The thing is that. That thing was running. I'm sorry, I'm going to say it again. Also, that thing was running Joomla, and so we had some issues there to get transaction support in there. Even. Yeah, well, of course, uh, I know production has its own rules, like a code has its own rules, so we don't always need to do it the right way. Uh, but still, really, uh, 
this, uh, for also this replication stuff. Uh, uh, Statement-based replication is, is weird, to say the least. Uh, so, for example, okay, I'm a Postgres server, so if you, don't, if you hate Postgres, fly on me. Uh, but still, you get uh, no, row-based replication, which I think MySQL is getting implemented in 5.6 or some near future, some near future. Uh, and then you get, uh, you know, it's single I/O thread that just you know, fetches data from the master, writes to the disk, doesn't even parse any SQL because there is no SQL out there. So you know, just okay, yeah, it's yeah. cool. It's cool that you managed to solve the problem, but it's a problem that shouldn't even exist in the first place. You're absolutely right. But sometimes, I mean, all, all of your arguments are absolutely true. Of course, you have to sometimes you know work with what you get from the customer. So yeah, that's, that's the big issue. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? More questions? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. According to the uh, indexes in MySQL, uh, sometimes it's uh, faster to use status count than index. How MySQL decide if you should use index or table count? Some database engines uh, use statistics. It's the same with MySQL. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no, so. I have no idea about the inner workings of that part of the engine. Mm -hmm. So it's good to check uh, how database engine decide uh, which use. Uh, it's uh, pretty often uh, yeah. depend on selectivity. It, it is. It's a very good idea always to figure out which engine you want to use for a certain application. Like some people still want to use my ISAM for certain reasons. Although N2D is like for 99 percent of the time it's more efficient. There are still some cases where my my ISAM will be better. Or uh, NDB cluster will be better. So it's always a very good idea if you expect a lot of traffic to check out which engine is this. And second thing, uh, when you start transaction, it increases the probability of deadlocks, right? So it's good to, uh, this is the disadvantage uh, which should be mentioned. Yeah. And uh, it's always good to plan start with planning uh, how to use transaction to avoid the loads. Yeah, exactly. If, if, I mean, this should never have been done. This was sort of like a quick fix <coughs> until we rewrote the entire system, basically. Um, so it's good for a quick fix, but you should definitely build in transaction support from the ground up in your application and have a way to roll back and stuff like that. Um, of course, in this case, you could say, you know, if a transaction fails, we lose a couple of log, logging hits is not critical, but still, you're absolutely right. If you build from scratch, build it in by default from the ground. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will put the slides online for those of you who are interested. Uh, please feel free to provide some feedback on joining. It's always nice to hear what you're doing. Thank you.